It was just before the Passover feast, Jesus knew that the time had come for him to leave this world and go to the Father. Having loved his own who were in the world, he now showed them the full extent of his love. The evening meal was being served, and the devil had already prompted Judas Iscariot, son of Simon, to betray Jesus. Jesus knew that the Father had put all things under his power, and that he had come from God and was returning to God. So he got up from the meal, took off his outer clothing, and wrapped a towel around his waist. After that, he poured water into a basin and began to wash his disciples' feet, drying them with a the towel that was wrapped around him. He came to Simon Peter, who said to him, Lord, are you going to wash my feet? Jesus replied, you do not realize now what I am doing, but later you will understand. No, said Peter, you shall never wash my feet. Jesus answered, unless I wash you, you have no part with me. Then Lord, Simon Peter replied, not just my feet, but my hands and my head as well. Jesus answered, a person who has had a bath needs only to wash his feet. His whole body is clean, and you are clean, though not every one of you, for he knew he was going to betray him, and he knew that was why he said not everyone was clean. When he had finished washing their feet, he put on his clothes and returned to his place. Do you understand what I have done for you? He asked them. You call me teacher and Lord, and rightly so, for that is what I am. Now that I, your Lord and teacher, have washed your feet, you should also, I'm sorry, you should wash one another's feet. I have set an example that you should do as I have done for you. I tell you the truth, no servant is greater than his master, nor is a messenger greater than the one who sent them. Now that you know these things, you'll be blessed if you do them. This is the word of God for the people of God. Thanks. Amen. You may be seated. And you can keep your Bible open. Uh, go ahead and turn to John chapter 14, uh, which if you don't have your own Bible, there's a blue Bible uh, underneath one of the seats in front of you. You'll find John 14 on page 1675 in, in that Bible. And uh, let me just acknowledge something up front. I want to acknowledge for you that I know that I am the second string uh, here today. Uh, pastor Thomas uh, serves as the lead pastor for the well, but he is preaching in our sanctuary services today, and so, so, so you, get, you get me. Now, I was, I was given some very specific instructions on what I needed to do to appropriately fill in for Thomas here at the, at the well. The first thing was I needed to have some sort of pop culture reference in my sermon. That was the first thing. Um, the second thing was that I needed to wear tennis shoes. Uh, the third thing, uh, I can't remember what that was, but the fourth thing was that I needed to wear skinny jeans. And just in case you're brand new here and you haven't met Thomas yet, th this, is, this is what I mean by, by skinny jeans. We're talking like painted on tight skinny jeans. I mean, to be honest, I've only seen him in something other than skinny jeans very few times. So I'm not even sure those aren't his real legs, the painted on skinny jeans. But luckily for you, I'm not going to do any of those things, okay? Because I'm not as smart as Thomas, and it's been about 30 years since I was in my skinny jeans phase, okay? And, and nobody wants to see that. So, so you're welcome. If you're disappointed, uh, then, then I just appreciate up front uh, your grace. If you have been here over the course of these last several months, we've been moving through the Gospel of John. And, and in our journey through the Gospel of John, uh, we found ourselves continually coming back to how John states the purpose of his gospel, the reason that he writes his gospel. It's found at the very end of John chapter 20, beginning in verse 30, John writes this, Jesus performed many other signs in the presence of his disciples, which are not recorded in this book, but these are written that you may believe that Jesus is the Messiah, the Son of God, and that by believing you may have life in his name. And we've come back to that over and over again to remember that this is the lens through which we are to read John's gospel. He writes so that you might believe that Jesus is the Messiah and that by believing in him, you might find life in his name. And this word believe, by the way, we've talked about, we don't mean it in the, in the somewhat shallow or flat way that we often think of it, more than just a mental assent to a list of ideas. To believe is to have faith, and to have faith is to have trust. 
And so the invitation that John is continually offering to us, he's been doing so for 13 chapters now, is the invitation to place our trust in Jesus, to believe in him as Messiah, as the Son of God, by believing in him to have life in his name. Now to locate ourselves in where we are in John's gospel, the the quickest way to express that is to say that today is Holy Thursday. Today is Holy Thursday. That's where we are in the story. So Jesus has already come to Jerusalem. Jesus has already entered into the city. He's been welcomed by crowds, waving palm branches, singing Hosanna, blessed is he who comes in the name of the Lord. Maybe you've heard that part of the story. He's now, this is several days later, he's gathered with his disciples to share the final meal with them. But not only is today Holy Thursday, last week was also Holy Thursday. And next week will be Holy Thursday. It's obviously not Holy Thursday because it's Sunday. But the reason that we're saying it's Holy Thursday is because John dedicates five chapters to recording the events of this final night that Jesus shares with his disciples. Uh, Brian didn't read the wrong scripture, by the way. That was the beginning of John's account. That's what you heard from Thomas last week as he spoke about the example, the pattern that Jesus sets in this act of of kneeling down and washing his disciples' feet. In a world where we value so much upward mobility, we see the downward movement of Jesus. As he bends down to serve his disciples, he expresses the kind of love that they're called to live in their life with one another. And immediately following that, that's why I want you to, wanted you to hear that again. Immediately following that, we move into this extensive section, chapter 14, 15, and 16, where Jesus is preparing his disciples for what is to come next. I'm I'm not going to read to you three chapters of John, okay? Can I get an amen? We're not going to read three whole chapters of John. We're going to bounce around a little bit in that, but I want you to think about Jesus preparing his disciples and just keep in mind the timeline here. So on this very same night, Jesus will be arrested. On this night, Jesus will be brought before the Jewish ruling council and he will be condemned. The next morning, he'll be handed over to the Romans. He will be crucified on a Roman cross. And before the sun goes down on the next day, the broken and bloody body of Jesus will be laid in a tomb. So for these disciples who are hearing these words from Jesus... They are mere hours away, not days, mere hours away from their entire world being turned upside down. So I want you to think about the timeline and what is about to happen as you hear these words that Jesus shares. So we're going to look at the bookends of this section first. So if you turn to John chapter 14, I want to read you the first two verses there first. Jesus says, this is how he starts this extensive section. Do not let your hearts be troubled. You believe in God, believe also in me. My father's house has many rooms. If that were not so, so would I have told you that I am going there to prepare a place for you. This is how Jesus begins this, this, uh, this extensive section of preparation. And if you go ahead and turn over to chapter 16, verse 33, uh, here's the final word in, in this section. He says, I have told you these things. So that in me you may have peace. In this world you will have trouble, but take heart, I have overcome the world. Now if you turn to the middle, uh, John chapter 15, I'm going to jump around a little bit here. But Jesus describes himself, he uses this imagery of him being the vine as his disciples being the branches. And using this imagery, he, he says this, remain in me as I also remain in you. No branch can bear fruit by itself. It must remain in the vine. Neither can you bear fruit unless you remain in me. I am the vine, he says. You are the branches. If you remain in me and I in you, you will bear much fruit apart from me. Did I just read that? No, I didn't. Apart from me, you can do nothing. Verse 9. Again, I'm the backup. What can I say? All right? (laughs) Verse 9. As the Father has loved me, so have I loved you. Now remain in my love. Verse 11. I have told you this 
so that my joy may be in you and that your joy may be complete. My command is this, love each other as I have loved you. Greater love has no one than this, to lay down one's life for one's friends. So this theme that we've seen over and over again in John's writings, this invitation to put your trust in Jesus, this is exactly what Jesus is offering to the disciples at the beginning, at the end, and here in the very middle. Jesus is saying, I need you to trust me. I need you to trust me. You have trusted me all along, all throughout this journey. I need you right now in advance of everything that is about to happen. I need you to trust me. Maybe you've had a moment like that in your life where you've either heard those words for some, from someone else or you've shared them with another person, eye to eye and heart to heart. You, I need you to trust me. This is what this moment is as, as he sits with his disciples and he prepares them for what the next 24 hours will, will bring. I need you to trust me. But there's something else that's, that, that is going on in, in these three chapters. There's, there's a, something of deeper significance, a promise that Jesus is articulating for his disciples in a more depth than he has at any other place in the scriptures. So we're, again, going to bounce around. You'll see up here the scriptures that I'm going to read for you if you want to write these down. But this is, this is the promise that Jesus is articulating as he, as he prepares them for what's next. He says, if you love me, this is 14, beginning in verse 15. If you love me, keep my commands. And I will ask the Father, and he will give you another advocate to help you and be with you forever. The spirit of truth, the world cannot accept him because it neither sees him nor knows him. But you know him for he lives with you and will be in you. I will not leave you as orphans. I will come to you before long. The world will not see me anymore. Chapter 14, beginning in verse 25, all this I have spoken while still with you, but the advocate, the Holy Spirit, whom the Father will send in my name, the advocate will teach you all things and will remind you of everything I have said to you. Peace I leave with you, my peace I give you. I do not give to you as the world gives, do not let your hearts be troubled and do not be afraid. Chapter 15, 26, when the advocate comes, whom I will send to you from the Father, the spirit of truth who goes out from the Father, he will testify about me, and you also must testify, for you have been with me from the beginning. Chapter 16, verse 7, listen to how Jesus takes this even a step further. Very truly I tell you, it is for your good that I am going away. Unless I go away, the advocate will not come to you, but if I go, I will send him to you. Jumping down to uh, verse 12, I have much more to say to you. Just think about that for a moment. Again, think about everything that is about to happen. Jesus says, I got a lot more. More than you can bear. But when he, the spirit of truth, comes, he will guide you into all the truth. He will not speak on his own. He will speak only what he hears and he will tell you what is to come. He will glorify me because it is from me that he will receive what he will make known to you. So this is Jesus saying, I need you to trust me. I need you to trust me in the same way that you have all the way up until this moment. I need you to trust me right now for what you are about to go through. But there's this thread that runs throughout all three of, this, uh, three of these chapters. There is this promise of one who is identified here in this translation as the advocate. Now let me show you, because again, Thomas is smarter than me, so I had to put something in here to make myself sound smart. Uh, this word advocate, no one liked that joke, but I did. Uh, this word advocate comes from the Greek word, you got to put it up there so I can try to, uh, try to pronounce it, parakaleo, 
Okay, that's, that's, the, that's the verb uh, of the word that is, that is translated here. And here, here's what that word means. Uh, it means to exhort or encourage, to comfort or console, to call upon for help, to appeal to one's behalf, to call to one's side, to admonish or exhort. The, the, the noun that is used here, paraclete, which by the way, if you try to put that in any sort of word processor, it will autocorrect to parakeet. Just, just a little fun aside there, just in case you're wondering. Kept coming up parakeet. Paraclete can be translated as advocate, as we, we have here. Also intercessor, consoler, comforter, helper. This is Jesus promising another one who will come, the one identified in this particular way, the one who will exhort and encourage and comfort and console, one you can call upon, one who will appeal on your behalf, who will admonish you, you can call to your side, one who will intercede for you, console you, comfort you, help you. This is Jesus speaking about the gift of the Holy Spirit. I am departing from your presence, but another will come, will be with you. And remember what what we read there, will not only be with you, will be in you. Jesus is speaking in advance of everything that is about to happen of the gift of the Holy Spirit that will come, that will teach them, that will guide them, that will testify to them about Jesus, that will give them his peace, will speak to them, the deeper knowledge and inviting them into that, that they will have the same divine strength, enabling them to remain in him, to love as he loved, to stand up against the evil, that is about to come their way. This is the gift of the Holy Spirit. But over the course of 2,000 years of Christian history and scholarship, this may be the most confusing thing about the Christian life. What exactly is the Holy Spirit? If you look in the scriptures, the Holy Spirit is described in in various ways. It's described uh, with the imagery of water and wind or breath. Or fire, among many others, you may hear that and go, I I would just like a little bit more clarity here. What exactly is the Holy Spirit? What does it mean? Is it like Casper the ghost? Is this some sort of weird thing that I, you know, we have all of these different perspectives. And my, my hunch is, from my own work with people, is that when we begin to talk about the Holy Spirit, there are some of you who might get a little bit nervous, And you may get nervous because you you think about a particular expression of the Holy Spirit that you've seen before, and you think to yourself, I'm just not sure that's me. Uh, That's not how I understand it. Maybe you've seen an expression of it, and you've thought, well, it doesn't work in me like that, so maybe it's not in me. Or maybe you've thought to yourself, well, this, this idea of a helper... This idea of an advocate, a consoler, a comforter, this is really nice. In fact, this is a really solid backup plan. But in your mind, you're thinking, I I can probably handle most things that will come my way in life. And I kind of like having control over my life. So, you know, in, in the instance, very rare, probably unexpected instance, that something might be beyond my control well, then there's the Holy Spirit, and I can turn to the Holy Spirit as a, as a backup plan. Or maybe you're just thinking, again, this is where it gets weird. It's a bit mysterious. What exactly does it mean? What is this gift that Jesus is speaking about? How, how are we to understand uh, the one that we would describe as the third person of the Trinity? God the Father, God the Son, and God the Holy Spirit. What does it mean when Jesus says that I will go away from you, but I will give you an advocate. I will give you the Holy Spirit to live in you, to teach you and instruct you in the way that you should go. In my life, uh, there's two passages that have helped form my understanding of what the Holy Spirit is in my life. And, and how I think the Holy Spirit, how we understand the Holy Spirit in, in one another's lives. And the first is from Colossians. 
This is Paul writing chapter 1, verse 27, if you want to look this up later. And there's a phrase in there that Paul uses as he speaks about the riches of what has been revealed to us through Christ. And he simply says this, Christ in you. Christ in you. Another translation renders it this way. The secret is simply this. If you want to understand the Christian life, it is Christ in you. When you put your trust in Jesus, when you give your life to Jesus, Jesus gives himself to you. And he does so through the gift of the Holy Spirit that comes to dwell in us, live in us. And then the other one is from 1 John chapter 4. Very simple phrase that we find there. I believe it's verse 1. It says this, The one who is in you, the Spirit. Again, we give our lives to Jesus. Jesus gives himself to us. We are given the gift of the Holy Spirit. The one who is in you is greater than the one who is in the world. Now consider that for just a moment. That the greatest power in all creation Jesus is promising, this is what I will give to you. This is what I will place in you. This is who will walk with you and teach you and encourage you and admonish you, help you know where to go, empowering you to do what seems impossible, to remain in him as he remains in you. In other words, the Holy Spirit is the very presence of God and it is the power of God that takes up residence in us when we entrust our lives to Jesus. Giving our lives to him, Jesus gives himself to us. So if you have given your life to Jesus, if you have along this journey or somewhere along the way of your life, if you have given your life to Jesus, this gift has been given to you. You may not understand it, but it's already there. The Holy Spirit is already alive in you. The presence of God, the power of God, whose purpose is to fulfill these same promises that Jesus makes to his disciples as they prepare for everything that comes next, for all that will come their way. The Holy Spirit who lives in you to bring truth in the midst of confusion. Maybe you're in a place of confusion in your life right now. The Holy Spirit brings truth. Brings peace in the midst of uncertainty. Maybe you're in a season of uncertainty. You don't know what's next. You have questions and, and, and you're not sure where to turn. But the Holy Spirit brings peace in the midst of uncertainty. Hope in the midst of a world that is broken. Have you noticed this, that we live in a broken world? The Holy Spirit is the hope that comes in the midst of that world. Love and grace in the midst of our shortcoming and our sin. The Holy Spirit's like the water, like wind. It's it's described as fire, but it's also described as breath. Which is what you're all doing right now, right? Is, Is everybody here breathing Some shook their heads. I I don't don't know what that means. The Holy Spirit, if you've given your life to Jesus, Jesus has given himself to you. And the Holy Spirit is as near as the very breath that you breathe. It is the life, the new life that, that, that has come in you by the gift that Jesus has given to you. So if you want to figure this out, if you want to somehow understand it more, here's what I would encourage you to do. Keep breathing. Keep breathing. And with each and every breath, recognize that there is a life that has has taken up residence in you. There is a presence and there is a power that has come to fulfill the promises that Jesus has made to you. The Spirit is as near to you as the breath that you breathe. So as we prepare to come to this table and receive these elements, the same meal that Jesus shared with his disciples, I want to invite you for just a moment to close your eyes and as best you can, 
I want to invite you just to breathe. Just breathe in and breathe out. And to recognize that the Holy Spirit isn't something that you have to figure out. It's not an equation you have to solve or an obstacle course that you have to get through. The Holy Spirit is the gift of God that has already taken up residence in you. The Holy Spirit is the life of God that is already speaking life into you right now. And here's a simple prayer that you might pray. Holy Spirit, breathe life into me. Holy Spirit, breathe life into me. Breathe truth in the midst of confusion. Breathe into us peace in the midst of our uncertainty. Hope in the midst of a a broken world. For some of us, Lord, that's, that's just something that we see. For others of us, Lord, we are right in the middle of it. And we pray that you would breathe life. We come to your table in a posture of repentance. Recognizing our shortcoming and our sin, we we cry out for mercy. And so Spirit, would you breathe love? Would you breathe grace? Would you breathe life into us as we partake of these gifts of life this day. This is our prayer in the name of the Father and the Son and the Holy Spirit. Amen.